Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Industrial Podcast Show. Matt McGregor and Bill Condon, your hosts. Today, we've got a special topic, uh, kind of an emergency podcast show that we put together uh, very quickly with the growing concerns of the coronavirus, but especially how it relates with supply chain. So really what we're gonna try to do in today's show is briefly take out the media hype. Uh, Let's get rid of that. uh, And we're gonna tell you, are you gonna get your diapers? Are you gonna get your pharmaceuticals? Is there gonna be toilet paper coming in uh, via via freight in the coming weeks? Or or should you, like a lot of people, jump in the Costco lines and, uh, and, and get your supplies. Um, briefly, you know, it's, it's really interesting how much this is, um, you know, hyped up right now. People are on red alert. I've actually got a neighbor, Bill, that has bought two months of supply of everything they need, pulled both their kids out of school, one high school student and one uh, elementary school student, and have now quarantined themselves in their house. They're not sick, and they're not coming out until this is over. Yeah, it's crazy. There's uh, there were some videos over the weekend of some of the lines at Costco being out the door. Uh, people are freaked out about it, and so it'll be great to uh, to have the experts on here to to talk about is it is is it real or or you know what what do we need to be doing here to prepare? That's right. And specifically, we have two guests that will help us tell us you know without any media hype how the freight's moving in the world and are we going to see a shortage. And when are we going to get back to normal levels or are we going to see a shortage? So we've got two special guests. I'm going to introduce Tim O'Brien. Tim is with California Cartage Company, which is a division of NFI. They are a three, th- uh, sorry, a third-party logistics company known as a 3PL. Uh, Tim's enjoyed over 25 years in the logis- logistics industry, focusing on all sp- aspects of supply chain, and he's worked for several uh, Fortune 500 3PL companies. Uh, welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks. Good to be here. Great. And uh, I'd like to introduce Todd Steffen. Todd is the uh, Vice President of Supply Chain and Logistics here at Collier's. Um, and I always tell people he is definitely one of the smartest guys uh, at all of Collier's. And so it's great to, to have Todd. Uh, Todd, uh, prior to being at Collier's, led supply chain uh, for Newell Brands and Walgreens, uh, led a lot of innovation for those companies. And uh, I know firsthand how knowledgeable that uh, Todd is on this topic. So, uh, Todd, great to have you with us. Well, that, thank you very much, Bill and, and Matt, for having me on. And, and Tim, good to be with you. Yeah. It's uh you know, it, it's a great time to be discussing this. I'm, I'm coming out of a conference uh, last week of RELA, which was the top retail industry leadership supply chain experts in the world. And we had a, a session uh, where this topic was brought up across 25 different major retailers. And then uh, I'm dialed into two other supply chain executive groups, one with 70 companies and one with 50 companies. And we've uh, had several uh, bits of discussion on this. We've We've taking a look at the trends uh, just from a freight flow standpoint and, uh, you know, are are happy to share our perspective today. Great. And and Todd, uh, maybe we start with you. Um, Are people going to get their toilet paper and diapers? Is the freight, how is the freight moving in the world right now? Are we behind what, you know, what's the situation? Yeah, great, great question, Matt. So, so here's the situation. Uh, Coronavirus impact is, is going to be felt for months uh, with regards to, you know, certain industries more more so than others, uh, the, the freight flow is related. I'll tell you what really uh, set us up for uh, kind of a perfect storm was obviously, you know, starting as early as early January, uh, companies in China, uh, manufacturing companies in China were ramping down, coming up to Chinese New Year on January 25th. So you already had several weeks of slow production. And then you had obviously an extended uh, period where people stayed away from the factories. Uh, China reported its lowest manufacturing numbers on record for the month of February. Um, so that, that tells you a little bit about, you know, just how much of a, of a gap there is. I was on with international freight forwarders uh, on Friday on a call, and they said, you know, that the people are starting to return to the factories in China. Uh, the, the freight is starting to move cross-border, and uh, much more so than it was in January and February with Chinese New Year and, and the beginning of, of uh, coronavirus impact. So there is, uh, you know, a, a loosening, if you will, of the freight from within China. 
but several industry supply chains, uh, automotive uh, probably leading the way, you know, will be feeling this effect for, for months in one form or another. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the ripple effects uh, are going to be, uh, there's, there's going to be a pig and a python, if you will, right? Because there's such a gap in, in, in uh, product being uh, produced in China. And, and now, eventually, a good portion of that product is going to have to move, you know, move through the, uh, the supply chain. Just to give you two other numbers, the Chinese seaborne import tonnage, okay, so imports into uh, China are down essentially from, from uh, last year's, uh, I should say a seven-year average, not counting this year, uh, are down 25 to 40%. Uh, that, that's into uh, China. And essentially that's main, you know, mainly dry bulk, iron ore, and coal, uh, followed by energy. And then exports uh, out of China are down, you know, they're basically, if right, if uh, the average, let's say, um, uh, after Chinese New Year, you know, we had gotten back up to about 85% of normal export volume, we're only uh, tapping 50% of, of uh, the total normal uh, volume. Wow. So really significant gaps. Uh, there have been uh, over 100 blank sailings from China, uh, you know, and you figure uh, eight to 10,000 TEUs per you know, that's almost a million uh, containers of product that haven't flowed out of China that normally would have been expected to. So, so really significant, um, you know, uh, impacts there. I will say also on the, on the uh, crude oil exports, so the top 10 exporting countries that are sending crude oil uh, to China, um, those numbers are actually up, but you got to keep in mind, you know, those shipments started 30 to 40 days ago expecting a normal rebound from, uh, from Chinese New Year. And, and now, obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's a far uh, less than normal uh, response after Chinese New Year. So, but the whole concept of shutting down for Chinese New Year is being rethought in, in light of this uh, situation. Yeah, I bet. Well, Todd, that's fascinating. I want to come back to you and, 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 and maybe ask specifically if there's products that you think are going to be the most vulnerable. Um, uh, but first, I want to shift real quick. Uh, Tim, you and I were driving in the car the other day, and you were, you were, you know, you know, we obviously work for a 3PL, so you're in and out of the port system every day. Tell us what's going on in the ports with knowing what Todd just said with 50% production uh, shortfall. What's going on in the ports and how is it affecting your business? Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, it's very good explanation by Todd as far as kind of the macro level, you know, specific to us in the Pacific Northwest, you know, being a, a West Coast gateway port, um, you know, we're going to be ones uh, along with LA Long Beach and our neighbors to the north, uh, you know, volumes are way down, um, you know, and, and kind of to that dovetail, one of the things I was thinking of when I was hearing this is, it, when the manufacturing came back on, the labor was, you know, slow in some cases to get back. I, I think we're going to feel that, you know, as the lulls in the, the trucking, uh, the drayage, even the warehouse labor to do the work, you know, when you have these lulls, people are going to, you know, they'll, they'll hang with you for a certain amount of time as far as temporary laborers or independent owner operators. But, you know, pretty soon they're going to be, you know, going to where the work is. So, right. you know, the, the hope is that uh, manufacturing and, you know, the volumes come back. We, I think we all you know, agree that they're going to be lower. But one of the concerns specific to kind of our piece of the puzzle, which is kind of the middle of the supply chain, I receive, you know, going to get the containers from the port and moving them through to, you know, uh, the Midwest and the southeast. The, the, the major concern I see is when you have labor that, you know, you're slowing down and you have to. You have to say, hey, you can't come in today. But you know, when when that pipeline finally hits, are are those people and trucks and resources going to be there when you say, okay, great, the spigot is turned back on. Where are you? Um, that's a concern for three PLs. Yeah, and as let's stay on that uh, topic for for a second. So, as a warehouse operator. What do you do in a situation like the, this to try to mitigate risk? Uh, in, in a large, in specific to our case, you've got a lot of temporary labor. So you kind of flex your labor. Uh, you obviously take care of your full-time employees. Um, but the, the temporary labor force in the Pacific Northwest is fairly good. You know, it's nowhere near the scale of L.A. Long Beach. But 
Um, you know, if you say, Hey, you can't work for a couple of days, but Hey, we've got something for you next week. Uh, the expectation might be when you call the, the staffing services, they're not there anymore. So now you've, you've put all your time and training and processes and people that know the, the, the rules as far as safety and compliance and KPIs, they're not there. So then you're just reinventing the wheel as far as, you know, retraining folks. So. Bill, this is Todd. Just keep in mind, I mean, we're at historic levels, uh, right? Uh, low levels of uh, unemployment, almost full employment in a lot of markets. So the situation is, you know, that the, uh, just like Tim said, the, the, the labor is going to go where the work is. And if the work's delayed because these freight flows are interrupted, uh, those folks, you know, are going to be at risk of just not being available to come back. That's a great point. Todd, uh, I'm going to come back to you with that question. But first, I'm going to get your opinion of this. I was talking to Casey Conway this morning. He's a national economist. And he thought we're in the first to second inning um, of the coronavirus, meaning we don't know what the future holds. And he actually called it, which I loved, was a self-induced panic recession. And he compared it to us shutting down the government with one exception is we controlled the on-off switch and we don't control the on-off switch here. So if you agree that this is a self-induced potentially panic recession, what supplies are we going to run out of uh, if, if you could pinpoint a few of those? Yeah, I mean, really, any what you're seeing the drop in is containerized volume from China. But, you know, that that's going to hit the headlines. But just keep in mind that China... Uh, sources componentry and, and in, you know, raw material input into other manufacturing processes, even if people have moved their uh, manufacturing, you know, to other uh, parts of Asia and Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, you know, seem to be, um, you know, a couple of areas, Indonesia, obviously, some to India, uh, those supply chains are still at risk, right? If, if they're getting any kind of componentry or input to that manufacturing process from China. And so, so just keep in mind, it's a, you know, the, the, the more layers that there are to the supply chain, the more risk there are. If, if some, even just one component of that leads back to China, uh, there's a risk there. I've seen uh, articles and, and uh, some leading thinking on, you know, this is going to be a huge boost to reshoring or nearshoring to Mexico. And, you know, the fact that it's a, a five-day trip to uh, New York from Mexico for a container versus, you know, far longer from China. And if these risks are, you know, uh, either, you know, if you look at Chinese New Year or trade war or uh, coronavirus induced, then, you know, you're going to look at people, uh, people are really going to look at, at China with more and more skepticism with regards to putting all their eggs in that basket. So I'm seeing a lot of momentum over the last three months, uh, coronavirus aside, where companies are really reevaluating their, their extended supply chain. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's something I talked to Casey about as well. Tim, what type of product do you import? Uh, where are you seeing the shortages across your supply chain right now? What type of specific products? Uh, we haven't seen it. It's starting to slow down, but uh, you know, the consumer retail goods is one uh, that we focus on. Uh, you know, a as an example, that that one, uh, the Chinese New Year, like like it was mentioned, slowed the volumes down. Now that it just hasn't picked up. You know, one of the things, uh, the resources we use here in the Pacific Northwest are the, the Northwest Seaport Alliance. Uh, I've got some friends that uh, interact with the ports in China, so we're getting news bulletins there. Uh, long story short is it, consumer retail right now, the volumes are way down, um, and, and it's very closely specific to us here. Um, it's seeing when those manufacturing uh, factories slash steamship lines slash ports really kick up and going. So I, post Christmas, retail is always kind of soft, but it's not this soft. Got it. And Todd, yeah, you just, mentioned just to back yeah, that. Go ahead. Just to back that up, Matt. Um, I was with twenty uh, distribution retail executives uh, last week, and basically every one of them uh, described the same exact profile uh, with regards to their freight and, and the inventories that would normally be replenishing now after the holiday and that kind of thing. Uh, every, everywhere from office supplies to, you know, fashion uh, to automotive parts uh, were, were severely impacted and, and everybody was, was you know, fairly 
um, in the same boat. That's interesting. You mentioned reshoring, which, you know, in some cases, maybe you could get up to speed quickly, but I would think reshoring is a, is a, is a long-term solution. Uh, I did hear of uh, a, uh, a facility in Augusta, Georgia, that manufactured uh, face masks that shut down about a year ago to, due to the cheap labor in China is now rebooting and, um, and they're going to be online in about two weeks. But I would think that would be the exception of the rule. So reshoring is a long-term issue, but uh, that's not going to cure a toilet plate paper issue in the coming weeks, right? Correct. Correct. So what about the food supply chain? Is there an impact there that we should be worried about? You know, it, it may or may not be, obviously it depends on the origin of the, of the food, but one of the other things to take into account is where is the uh, capacity, right? Where Where's the capacity right now? And when you look at uh, the container, uh, uh, source of containers, right? There's a, there's a flow that's expected in and out of China for containers. And when you find that you've, you know, starved the flow of inbound, let's say to China, because there weren't people there to, to offload them or, or whatever the reason, um, now you've got, you know, you've got equipment out of position. And uh, see, so you know, food, obviously, uh, domestic versus import is, is going to be uh, the real driver as to whether there's going to be shortages there. But, but just overall, you got to keep in mind, it's not only the product, but it's the equipment to move the product, these containers all over the world that are being disrupted as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mimic. Yeah, go the, ahead, Tim. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that's something that the the general public, you know, when you when you read the, you know, when you hear the morning the morning or afternoon news, that's something you don't think about. Is you know, this is a big game of Tetris, and you got to keep your containers, you know, in the right positions. They are definitely out of kilter right now, so that's that's a, a critical component of the supply chain that. That folks, okay, great. The manufacturing facilities ramp back up, but there's no boxes to move them to us. What do we do? You can't, you know, there's no virtual, virtual machines that can transport them Star Trek style to the United States. <laughs> so great point. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you know, guys, it's interesting because we're starting to see a lot of companies cancel, uh, you know, big conferences and and things that you know require travel across the U.S. You guys being experts and talking with with other experts day in and day out, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that has a huge impact to hotels, to airlines, to to, to everything. But do you think that's an overreaction at this point, or what's your take? My this is uh, my take is that it's not an overreaction only because people. I mean, they have to put the safety and health of, of their employees, you know, at the top of the list. And I mean, look at just TPM. Right, the number of companies, uh, both on the international freight side of things, as well as attendees, you know, shippers, BCOs that have just canceled the whole thing, right, with regards to their attendance. And, and these are these are normally, you know, thousands and thousands of people getting together to transact around the future uh, international, you know, freight agreements, and and just those discussions just did not happen, at least in person, they didn't. Uh, you look at uh, international travel has been banned on, by so many companies, uh, you know, for, for not only just the next few weeks, right? It's, it's for the foreseeable future. Uh, one huge software company I just heard this morning, because uh, I know somebody that works there, they banned all domestic travel. And not to, not to create hype or anything, but I mean, these things are going on. And to your point, Bill, uh, you know, hotels, uh, the hotel industry and travel industry are going to have you know, uh, they're going to feel the ripple effect of this for quite a while. And Todd, you mentioned uh, how, you know, obviously when they start canceling flights, the um, the amount of uh, time that it takes to get everybody on flights and back where they're supposed to go is a, is a supply chain nightmare in itself. You mentioned that the containers are all messed up all over the world now. How do we straighten that up? Again, it's going to be a prolonged, uh, you know, reflow, if you will, or, or a long correction. Um, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. And to Tim's point, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we're going to, as supply chain professionals, we're going to have to, you know, take our best thinking and resiliency and disaster planning and things like that and, and really take it to a global level. And uh, it's, it's something that, that hasn't, uh, the, these volume effects have not been seen before at least, you know, in such a concentrated one-two punch with with Chinese New Year and uh, and coronavirus. So, 
Tim and Todd, and in closing, if I could ask you guys, if you said to the listener, you run out and buy one item, what would it be? <laughs> I, I would have to say just, you know, obviously the basics, right? Make sure you're stocked up on, on things. But a lot of those things are domestically supplied, but we don't know the effect and, and the impact on the domestic supply chains, right? When you look at some of these cases that are popping up for sometimes uh, unknown reasons. Um, so obviously, you know, it's, it's the basics, uh, Matt, is, is what I would say. And then anything uh, having to do with, you know, hand sanitizer, uh, any kind of sanitation and or, um, you know, whatever the common medicines are that are being used to, uh, to at least comfort during these, uh, these situations. Right. That, that, that would be my twist is, you know, something that's sourced uh, internationally, you know, if, if it was me for my daughter, it would be, you know, aspirin or ibuprofen or something like that, some sort of medical supplies. But, you know, to kind of go backwards in, in closing a little yeah, the state, the, the question was asked, you know, is, is, is this kind of overkill as far as safety? Safety is number one. I mean, being in supply chain my whole life, if there's even a sniff of something that's going to happen, you know, it's always safety first. So, you know, I, I can understand why TPM and, and lower, you know, lower attendance at Rela and, and the, at the end of the day, it's, you know, you, you, you need to take care of your people because they're the ones that take care of you. And if it, there's, it's, if it's going to be unsafe, then don't do it. So, well, guys, uh, this has been very, very insightful. So Tim and Todd, uh, thank you for, um, for your thoughts on this. You guys are, are definitely thought leaders in the supply chain industry. And this is obviously a very important and relevant topic. So a uh, very insightful. Thank you both. And, um, we appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. 